Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. And here is today's presenter, Julian Archer. Ah, what a pleasure it is to be here, friends. I've, I've actually never been here before. And uh, it's, it's beautiful to be here. And I thank Daniel for his invitation. He's not here this morning, uh, but Daniel very kindly invited me to come along and share with you today. Uh, my name is Julian Archer. I've been asked to give a brief introduction of, of who I am. Um, it, I, I've had a, a lot of lives. Uh, as I look back across it all, I, before we were Christians, um, I grew up in a family, a business family. My, my parents were serial entrepreneurs in the 60s and 70s. We then became hippies. Uh, so my childhood was very much sort of the hippie childhood. We were a little bit late. It was the 70s. So everybody did it in the 60s, but mum and dad were busy in the 60s, so we did it in the 70s. Uh, growing up, you know, out in the bush, no electricity, no running water, bare feet, clothes occasionally as needed, uh, and all that sort of thing. So that was the early years. Uh, became Christians, uh, and mum and dad just wanted to tell everybody about Jesus because he made such a change in their lives. And so they were still in business, but they became lay, lay evangelists, supporting from their own businesses. And uh, that was sort of my teenage years. Uh, I then became, did a teaching degree, graduated on a Sunday and went back into business on the Monday. Um, spent a few years in business, worked with ADRA for four or five years in Australia and in Nepal. Came back into business uh, and sold our last business in 2007 um, and retired then and then started a ministry called Faith Versus Finance. Um, and so I've spent a few years traveling around the world speaking on the relationship between money and spirituality and the challenges that it can bring. Uh, often as our money goes up, our faith goes down because we don't need God anymore because he's given us so much. And then when our money goes down, our faith goes up. <laughs> we go, Lord, I've got to pay the bills. And, and so we, I, I share about that around the world. And, um, and then uh, about eight months ago, I got a phone call from North New South Wales Conference to Melinda and I saying, would we come down and join them to do project management with them? They were wanting to uh, do a lot of exciting projects around the conference. Uh, and they wanted them to be sustainable and have a business foundation to them. Uh, and in God's strength, that's where we are now, doing our best to set up some things like vegetarian cafes and um, pop-up health retreats. Um, what else are we doing? Evangelistic series. Sorry? Yeah, juice, a juice bar at Raymond Terrace. Um, so a number of things that cross between business and ministry. You know, we've got to, we've got to meet the people where they're at. And these days, they're, they're not here. Uh, I mean, we, we are here, but the general public doesn't come here on a regular basis and so we have to go to where they are and, and set up our programs where they are in, in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so that's, that's where, that's a, a very brief journey uh, to here and I praise God through that process that uh, he has shown me his love and I've responded to that. And I want to share about that this morning uh, in, a, in a message titled Blessed Assurance. But before we do, let, let's just bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you this morning with grateful hearts. Lord, regardless of what has happened in our week, we can come here, we can take time out, we can come to the foot of the cross and see your love and receive that peace, Lord, that, that passes understanding because even in the mess of this world, we can have that deep, deep peace because we know who we are in you and where you are taking us. So Lord, we thank you for bringing us here and I just pray now that our hearts will be opened by your Holy Spirit as we share together this beautiful gospel message on blessed assurance. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The, the message this morning will... Let me, let me give you a money-back guarantee. So this is a, It's the businessman in me, okay? So I'll give you a money-back guarantee this morning that you will leave this place this morning informed, inspired, or irritated. 
<laughs> okay, there it is. Typical businessman. It covers all bases and offers the money back guarantee. Okay, so, that, so that's it. You, you're going you're to leave here with one of those three. And I praise God because it's the Holy Spirit that informs us and inspires us and sometimes irritates us because he knows that that's what we need to take us forward. So that's the, the guarantee for, for the sermon. The Archbishop of Canterbury... You'll remember this quote from maybe from Ellen White's writings or some of the history books. Uh, The Archbishop of Canterbury once spoke to an actor, a famous actor, and he said to this actor, Mr. Betterton was the guy's name, and this is going back about 150 years, Mr. Betterton, tell me why it is that you actors affect your audiences so powerfully by speaking of things imaginary. Okay? You're not even speaking of things that are real, and your, your audiences are affected so powerfully. How, how do you do that? Betterton replied, he said, My Lord, who was a preacher, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, My Lord, with due submission to your grace, permit me to say that the reason is plain. It all lies in the power of enthusiasm. We on the stage speak of things imaginary as if they were real. But you in the pulpit so often speak of things real as if they were imaginary. Friends, I don't hope that Jesus will return. I know that Jesus will return. It's real. The prophecies that we love so much as as Seventh-day Adventists, they're not predictions about the future. God never predicts the future. He foretells it because he knows it. He's not going, well, I predict that this will happen. 50-50, 90-10, what's the prediction? How good a prediction? No, no, he says, this is what's going to happen because I've seen it. And this is how it will happen. And when the Bible tells us that Jesus will come back and when Jesus himself tells us that he will come back, he will come back. We don't have to hope that he will. We can know that Jesus is coming back and we can know that he's coming back soon. But the question that arises through, through all of that is, can we know that we are saved? Can we know today that we are saved? Is it possible? Can we know it? You know, there's been truckloads of books written on this topic because knowing about your salvation, it's about faith, it's about grace, it's about law, it's about works, it's about salvation, it's about all those different things. And so there's, there's just been reams of books written on it. So this morning, over the next few minutes, I'm, I can't do it justice. But I just want to share with you what's on my heart and from God's word, what I believe about whether we can know that we are saved. You know, Melinda was sharing with us about Fanny Crosby and the hymn that we're going to sing at the end of this is Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. That was written in 1873. You may have noticed the dates that Melinda had up there. Uh, Fanny Crosby was born in 1820. Ellen White was born in 1827. They both died in 1915. Okay, so they, they were basically contemporaries right through their lives. Uh, Fanny Crosby was a Methodist throughout her life, a very devout Methodist. As we know, Ellen White was a Methodist until she became a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, so two ladies that God raised up with somewhat different purposes, but ultimately in God's purpose, the same purpose. So that's, that's just to put it in place. But the question that you might ask looking back and looking at her hymn and how she wrote and she had so much faith about her assurance is, is that sort of assurance only for 19th century hymn writers? Only for 19th century prophets? Or is it something that we can know ourselves today? Is the knowledge of salvation reserved solely for people born in the year 1899 or earlier? Sometimes it seems that way, you know, when we read the books and and we we compare current books about faith and about Christianity and books from the the 1800s, they seem to differ in some ways. Can we know that we are saved? When when my dad became a Christian, when my mum and dad became Christians, I was about 10, 11, 12 over those sort of, those few years. And of course, they're on fire. They're, They're loving having... God in their lives and, and, and just it's changed them so much. 
And my dad would come to me and he would say, Julian, if you died tonight, are you sure that you have eternal life? Now that's a tough question for a kid who's not yet a teenager. But it can be a tough question for you anywhere in, anywhere in life. You know, right through to the, on your deathbed. You know, one of the ladies at, at work the other day was saying, she's a pastor's wife and she spends a lot of time beside the deathbed of, of elderly Christians, elderly Adventists. And she's saying how sad it is that so many times they don't know whether they're saved. And they, they come to that point in their life just wondering, am I saved? Have I been good enough? Have I done the right things? Have I lived the right way? Have I done enough? And she said it's just so, so sad that they don't have that assurance of salvation. If you could know for sure, if you could know with 100% certainty that you are going to live forever and ever and ever and just try and get your head around that, but if you could know that you are going to live forever and ever in a perfect place, would that affect what you do this afternoon? Would that affect what you do this week? Would that knowledge, would that assurance change the way you live? I believe it would. I believe it would change if you had that assurance. And as I look back on my own life, when I, had, when I got that assurance, it completely changed everything. It completely changed everything. It would change your relationships. It will change your finances and your relationship to money. It will change your relationship to your planet when you know that you're going to live forever. It changes everything. I want to share with you a quote. This is by Ellen White, Our Father Cares, page 68. She says that faith is not an opiate, a drug that makes you drowsy, but a stimulant. Looking to Calvary will not quiet your soul into non-performance of duty, but will create faith that will work, purifying the soul from all selfishness. I love that. I love that turn of phrase. It's not an opiate, but a stimulant. It doesn't put us to sleep and make us know, okay, make us go, well, let's just wait until Jesus comes. We're saved. We don't need to do anything. No, faith is a stimulant. It drives our life. We saw in the announcements, I saw a beautiful little title. I think it was for a seminar or a retreat or something. This world is not my final home. This world is not my final home. This world is our home. Sure, we're just passing through. We are pilgrims and strangers passing through. But this is our home. And we've been created to care for this home. And when we have faith, it's a stimulant to do many things. True faith will not cause us to neglect the environment because it's all going to burn anyway. True faith will make us want to care for the environment. It won't cause us to rip off our employees or colleagues because they're not saved anyway and I'm not going to have to live with them for eternity. No, not at all. It will be a stimulant to make us want to care for them. Faith won't make us waste our time because, well, I've got an eternity ahead of me anyway. I've got all the time in the world. I've got all the time in the universe. No, faith is a stimulant that will make us care for our time. And as, as the psalmist said in 90 verse 12, uh, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. True faith leads to faithful works, faithful relationships and faithful time management. So can we know that we are saved? Let's go and have a look at some verses of scripture to see whether the people who were writing the scriptures knew that they were saved. Let's go to Job 19, 25 to 27. Oh, sorry, my fonts have played up a little bit there, but you can still read it. This is Job, one of the oldest books in scripture. This is as far back as we can go in the Bible, as far as when it was written. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand at last on the earth. He knows this, he's sure of it. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Okay, so did Job know? He knew, he was sure. Let's go to Daniel, the end of Daniel. Daniel had a very special blessing. He was actually told, like a message straight from heaven. He was told, you, Daniel, go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. 
You know, I sometimes think, oh, I'm a little bit jealous of that. But I've got nothing to be jealous of that Daniel was told that. I've just got to open my Bible. And I'm told page after page after page exactly what Daniel was told. If I believe, I have eternal life. John 3.16. Oops, sorry, no, I've, I've missed it there. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. The, the theologians, and I'm not a theologian by any stretch of the imagination, but the guys who understand Greek tell me that where it says that shall have eternal life, the, a better translation in the tense of that Greek word have is that they shall keep on having eternal life, which means that they already have it and they shall keep on having it. Let's go to John 6, 47. Most assuredly I say to you that he who believes in me what has, has eternal life. Friends, this is the gospel. This is good news. It's been good news ever since the world was created, but this is it. You can know that you have eternal life. Oh, there's John 3.16 there. 1 Peter 1, 6 to 9. Now, this is an interesting one. He says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So that, that can be us here in 2019 that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When did these people receive their salvation? When Jesus comes back? No, they receive it now. They receive it when they're going through all those tough times. They receive their salvation now. What about Paul? Philippians 1.21, he said that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, why would it be a gain to die? Well, only if you know where you're going. If he knows that when he dies, he's going to go and be with Christ at the resurrection, then that's a gain because he wouldn't have to put up with all these floggings and shipwrecking and jail and everything else that he had to go through while he was here following Christ. To live is Christ, to die is gain. He knew where he was going. And in 2 Timothy 4, the last chapter of the last book that we have of Paul's writings, he's writing from, from Rome and he's in prison. He's, and he's writing to young Timothy. He says, Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. That's us. That's us. To all who have loved his appearing. So is the blessed assurance only for Bible writers and blind hymn writers and modern day prophets? No. It's for all of us. One of my favorite verses. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. This is John giving one of the purposes for why he wrote. Why did he write John and 1st and 2nd, 3rd John in the book of Revelation? So that we may know that we have, right now, eternal life. This is life-changing, friends. When, you, when, when, when the, the synapses and everything sparks in your, in your brain and you finally begin to realise and I know many of you realize this already, I'm preaching to the choir, but for me, this was, this was life-changing. I have eternal life. That, that, that just completely changes. When you walk out there on the street and you look around at the world, you, you see it through a different set of glasses because it's, it's, a, it's a different worldview, a different perspective. God doesn't want you to think or hope that you have eternal life. He wants you to know that you have it. Romans 10 verse 9, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But will we have times of doubt? Will we wrestle with our faith? Will we have challenges and, and we wonder whether there's enough evidence of conversion in our lives? Or is it all roses? Once you, once you know, yep, I'm saved. Do you ever question that again? Sometimes you do. Sometimes times get tough. Sometimes we have doubt. But we have to remember that God is 
faithful. Lady here that I'm going to quote from, this is, uh, I probably should have put these slides up a little bit earlier. For those of you who haven't come across the name Ellen White, uh, Melinda described Fanny Crosby before and gave a bit of a history of her life. Another lady that I've quoted a couple of things from is Ellen White. Uh, And she was the, the one I was talking about as a contemporary of Fanny Crosby. The Smithsonian Magazine, uh, which is a magazine put out by the Smithsonian Institute, which cares for somewhere around 20 of the greatest museums across the United States, um, puts this magazine out. And this was a collector's edition from a couple of years ago. And it was an edition on the 100 most significant Americans of all time. Okay? So... It's, uh, you, you get some pretty big names in there. It's a bit hard to read, but I can see there Neil Armstrong, Madonna, Billy the Kid, Michael Jordan, you know, people that, names that you recognise. Well, it's very interesting that this particular lady that I'm talking about, Ellen White, is number eight in this magazine. And this is because the Smithsonian Institute recognised that Ellen White has made such an incredible uh, contribution to many aspects of American life, to education, to health, to spirituality, to family, to so many different aspects of American life. And they, and they put her in there and they describe her life from 1827 to 1915. She also uh, is a co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, along with uh, a couple of other people, including her husband, James White. Her books, she is, she is the most translated female author on the planet and the most translated American author of either gender. The second most translated lady on the planet is a lady by the name of J.K. Rowling from Harry Potter fame. So to give you an idea of, of the, the difference between first and second place in the, with these two ladies and their translations, Harry Potter has been translated into about 70 languages. Uh, Ellen White's writings have been translated into, last time I checked, 175 languages and counting. So when this lady writes, I listen. I I also happen to believe that she had the spiritual gift of prophecy that God chooses to give to some people and that she was a prophet for our time. Uh, And so, yeah, I I really like what she says. And here's one of the things that she writes uh, from a book called Patriarchs and Prophets. Now, remember, before I got sort of a bit sidetracked there, we're talking about will there be times of doubt? Will there be times of wrestling, uh, wrestling with our faith? This is what she wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 202, 203. Jacob's history, so this is Jacob, the patriarch, is an assurance that God will not cast off those who have been betrayed into sin but who have returned unto him with true repentance. Thus it will be with those who live in the last days. That's us today. As dangers surround them and despair seizes upon the soul, they must depend solely upon the merits of the atonement. So are are we to depend solely upon our works, upon our goodness, upon our righteousness? No, we are to depend solely upon the merits of the atonement, the at-one-ment of what, what Jesus did to make us one again with God. We can do how much of ourselves? Nothing. In all our helpless unworthiness, we must trust in the merits of the crucified and risen Saviour. None will ever perish while they do this. He who listened to the cries of his servants of old will hear the prayer of faith and pardon our transgressions. He has promised and he will fulfil his word. Friends, God is faithful. When you're going through a a period where you're questioning, am I good enough? Am I really saved? Remember what Paul said in Philippians to the church in Philippi. He wrote this. He said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you, all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Friends, when you're going through a bit of a grey period and you're, and you're thinking, am I really saved? Open up the Bible to Philippians 1.6 and say, Lord, you know I'm struggling. You know I'm battling. You know I, I, I want to believe, but I don't believe enough. But you said that you will 
finish the work that you have begun in me. And Lord, I just move forward on my knees, claiming that promise. And let the peace of God cover you and get up off your knees and go and live for him. Our assurance of salvation is not to be based on our changing feelings, but on the unchanging word of God. God is faithful. Hold on to Jesus one day at a time, one moment at a time, and he will complete his good work in you. So do I need to be good enough, worthy enough, busy enough, righteous enough, strict enough to be saved? The answer is no. Our salvation and assurance doesn't come from us. It comes from Christ. That's where that assurance comes from. Is the song blessed assurance or blessed insurance? (laughs) It's blessed assurance, isn't it? If it were blessed insurance, then we would spend our time worrying about, have I paid for my policy? Are the dates right? Is it up to date? Have I included everything about my life? Will all of me be saved? Maybe I've only got the house, but not the contents. You know, (laughs) that's what it would be. But it's not blessed insurance. It's blessed assurance. We're not paying off something so that when disaster strikes at the end of this world, we get to go, we get a ticket to heaven. That's blessed insurance. And it won't work. We have blessed assurance. We have it today that no matter what happens, no matter whether there's floods or fires or anything, we're going through because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, not because of what we have done. Now, of course, the question arises, and for some of you who I promised would get irritated in this sermon, you're sitting there already going, (laughs) you're going, but what about works? What about works? Well, that, well, that's actually the next sermon, and i sorry, but that's, <laughs> that's another day. Um, but I do have a second one, uh, and it, it, it's called Opiate or Stimulant, which is what we've been touching on here as well. Uh, and it is, perfect. it is very important, as James said, you know, faith without works is what? It's dead. That's right, because faith is a stimulant to do the good works. Let's have another look at another quote here from Our Father Cares. Instead of releasing man from obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enables us to render obedience. Okay, so the relationship between faith and obedience or faith and works is right there. Your works without faith are hopeless and your faith without works is dead. So faith and works come together. You know, I think in the church a lot of times we have a lot of Um, discussions and and also even arguments about what is really just semantics, you know, about the meanings of words. And we can get so fired up because somebody else doesn't see it the same way as I do. Whereas both sides of the debate actually both believe in faith and works. But sometimes it's important that we focus on this one and sometimes it's important that we focus on this one. But the whole time we've got to have both. We've got to preach both. We've got to live both in our lives. Does our faith, our faith in our assurance, does it make us want to war earnestly against our faults? Or do we just go, well, I'm just going to let that happen and when Jesus comes back, because I know I'm saved, and when Jesus comes back, he'll get all that stuff out of me. No. It does, doesn't it? The faith that Jesus gives, true faith, makes us want to war earnestly against our faults. It makes us say, Lord, please... Do in me what I've seen you do in others. What I've seen, you know, we look at the the life of the Apostle John. The son of thunder became a son of God. You know, he and his brother came to Jesus when they were young. They were, they must have been a a sight to be seen. They, They were called the sons of thunder. They just loved to argue and they were just wild boys. But after spending time with Christ, they became sons of God. And we read again in Ellen White's writings that by the end of John's life, she says that in the life of the disciple John, true sanctification was exemplified. Do you know what sanctification is? It's the process of becoming like Christ, the process of becoming like Jesus. And so he went from being a son of thunder through warring earnestly. She also says he warred earnestly against his faults. And we see that a lot in his writings. We see him come through to being like Christ. Assurance doesn't cancel obedience. Remember, faith is not an opiate, it's a stimulant. A stimulant to do good works and reveal God. 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Paul says the whole process beautifully there. He says that you are saved by grace through faith. And then in verse 9, for good works. By grace, through faith, for good works. It's the whole, the whole process. But our assurance can stand on no other foundation. It can lie in no other place. It can lean on no other support. It can hang from no other nail, from no other beam than the very cross of Jesus Christ. Friends, we have nothing. We have nothing. There is nothing in us that can give us assurance of salvation. It's all Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And that's good news too. (laughs) Because if I had to do something to get my salvation, other than just believe and have faith in Jesus and what he's done, it would be a real tragedy for me. It is his perfect life on my behalf, his death for my sins, his resurrection as my saviour and his ministry as my high priest that I accept. And in doing so, I receive the assurance today of eternal life with him forever. Desire of Ages, one of the most beautiful books ever written on the life of Christ. Desire of Ages, page 388. Those who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart, what everlasting life? Have everlasting life. It is through the spirit that Christ dwells in us and the spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal. Friend, when when you accept Jesus Christ into your life, and I know I'm harping on this, and I'm going over and over and I'm preaching to the choir, but friends, this is the gospel. This is the best news you're going to hear today. Okay? When you believe in Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit comes into your life, that is the beginning of your eternal life. Beginning of life eternal. Paul gives it an interesting twist where he says in 2 Corinthians 1.10, he's talking about Jesus, he said, who delivered us, past tense, from so great a death and does deliver us, present tense, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us, future tense. For the theologians out there, you've got justification, sanctification, and glorification in one verse. And it's all Jesus. It's all Jesus. I have been saved. I am being saved. And I will be saved. That's it. Justification, sanctification, glorification. I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved all because of what Christ has done. But how can I know that I'm forgiven? How can I know that I'm covered with Christ? You know, it's not, it's not as though when I'm forgiven, uh, a, a light goes from red to green in, in my prayer room, and I go, oh, yes, I'm forgiven. Look at that, I've got the green light. How, how, can, I, how can I know that? You know, I stay on my knees until the light comes on. No, no, how can I know with certainty? And the answer is this, friends. Don't look at yourself. Look at Christ. And then the questions will not be, am I perfect? Have I done enough? Uh, will I die for my sins? The questions change. When we look at Christ, the questions become this. And I, I'd like you to answer these questions for me. They're, they're simple questions, yes or no. Did Christ live a perfect life? Did Christ conquer sin and death? Did he do it for me? Did he rise again? Is he ministering on my behalf in heaven right now? Can I trust him? Yes, 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 and a thousand times yes. And friends, when when we turn from ourselves and turn to Jesus, it's yes. Am I forgiven? Yes, because I asked forgiveness. I came and repented of my sin and had sorrow for my sin, and he took that sin and he took it away. And he said, Julian... Get up off your knees and go and live for me with a green light. You've got the green light. Go because of what Jesus has done. We have to base our faith on the eternal work of Christ, the internal work of the Holy Spirit, and the external proof of God's word. But what about the judgment? Oh, the judgment. I don't know about you, but when we, when we became Christians... There were these little uh, cartoon booklets around that came out of America. 
and one of them was about the judgment. And there was this little story, I can still picture it. Cartoons are, <laughs> cartoons are good for putting things in your brain. There's this guy, and he's, he's, he turns up at church, um, and, but one day he's out in the yard, and he's, he's having a secret cigarette out the back of the shed, and he knows that that's not good, and he's having this cigarette. And while he's having this cigarette, he has a heart attack, and he dies. <laughs> okay? And they put him in the grave, and then the next scene is he's, he's coming up out of the grave at the second coming. And then the scene after that is a picture of him standing in front of the judgment seat of God. And there's a picture on the screen of him having a smoke behind the shed. <laughs> it's terrifying stuff but when, when you're reading this through, right? And, uh, and to me, that was what the judgment was like. There's going to be this huge screen. And my whole life is going to be put up there on the screen. Right? And I've got to stand there, and there's like thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 angels, not to mention the rest of the world who has ever lived, all my family and everyone, and they're going to see all my sins on the screen. Okay? So that's, that's the sort of judgment that I, that I understood. Um, and something tells me that that's not, how it's not, that's not how it's going to be. And that's something that tells me that is the Bible. So let's, let's have a little bit of a look. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is a courtroom scene. Sorry that it's so small. Um, and sorry that it's got an American flag and not an Australian flag. But, you know, <laughs> when you Google images, you, you go with what you can get. And so in a courtroom, it's the same here in Australia, basically. I don't spend a lot of time there, but sometimes. Uh, <laughs> you've got a judge at the front. You've got a record keeper in front of the judge. Yeah, I've got a pointer here. Look at that. Okay, you've got your jury over here. You've got your advocate or your defence lawyer with you. You've got you, or in this case, me. You've got the accuser, and you've got the prosecuting lawyer and the onlooking universe, okay? So that's, it. that's your judgment scene, all right? Now, it's a scary place. When, when you go into judgment, it's a scary place, usually because you know you've done wrong, and you're sitting there hoping that you're going to get let off lightly, okay? It's a, because if, if, you've, if you've gone into court and got to the point where there's a judge and a jury there's a fair chance that you probably, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so you've probably done something not right. Not always the case, but, but it can be. So you're sitting there shaking in your, in your chair, and, it, and this is the eternal judgment, remember, because we're going into, the, this is the judgment of God now, or the judgment of us in, in the, at the end of time. Who is the judge? God is the judge. Uh, Jesus is the judge. Okay. Let's go to uh, John 5.22. Grab, grab your Bibles there and go to John 5.22. And then if someone can read that out for me nice and loud, please. John 5.22. So the judge is Jesus. Now, for those of you who said God, you know, it's a, we believe in the Trinity, okay? So, so God is one. Um, but he's, he's given the judgment role to the Son. Now, is this the same Son who came all the way down from heaven and lived and died for you so that you could be saved? Has he changed his mind about his love for you? No. And, and he's your judge, right? Yes. Okay, so should we be fearing him? Yes. <laughs> yes, no, that's right. Fear, it depends on how you look at the word fear. But fear, that's right. So he's up there and he's the judge. All right, so let's just put Jesus up there. All right? Well, that brings you a little bit of a relief, doesn't it? Okay? He's also the jury. Okay? Judge and jury. You could say he's appointed the jury. But he is the jury. Because he's the judge, he's also going to be the jury in this case. Um, just coming across here to advocate and defense. We, won't, we don't have time to look up whoops, all these texts, but 1 John 1, 9 through to 2.1 says that he is our advocate. He's, he's our defense. Okay? He's defending us. So he's defending us to himself, to the judge, because he's also the judge okay? and the jury. Right? Okay. This is rigged, friends. This is rigged. I can assure you this is rigged. <laughs> okay. Over on the right-hand side, I didn't show it before, but there's the witness. Okay. The witness who saw all that stuff that I thought was going to be up on a big screen. Okay, he's the witness. Jesus is the witness. Revelation 3.14 says that he is the faithful witness as well. What about there in the middle, the record keeper? Well, who's the record keeper? 2 Corinthians 5.10, he's the record keeper as well. This is rigged. <laughs> now, we've still got these two seats over here. 
and we've still got me sitting there. Uh, where will we go first? Oh, look out. Let's go to Galatians 3. Turn, turn your Bibles to Galatians 3. And I want someone to read verse 10 and verse 13. Galatians 3, 10 and 13. Now, for those of you who weren't convinced this is rigged, <laughs> this is rigged, isn't it? Because Jesus takes my place. Is this the most amazing courtroom scene in the universe? It's the most beautiful thing. That when we accept the love of God, when we accept, yes, Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are, that you did what you said you did, that you, can, that you want to save me and you will save me and you can save me and you are saving me, he takes all those roles, including sitting in my seat. What about these other two guys on the side here, the prosecuting lawyer and the accuser? I've, the prosecuting lawyer, what do they use as the standard against which they are going to judge you? The law. Whose law? God's law. Okay, so who understands the law better than anyone else in the universe? God does. Jesus does. That's right. So this... This guy, wipe him out. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, he doesn't... It, it's God's law. He's going to be the best lawyer in the room. Okay? What about the accuser? Now, we, we're coming up against a pretty powerful being here now. Okay? But what do we read in Revelation 12.10? The accuser was cast down. So that's it. That's the courtroom scene. <laughs> it's not a bad deal, really, is it? I mean, friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news of salvation. And again, I'm, I'm not saying that this doesn't, that we can now go and do whatever we want, or that we don't have to do anything at all. This is motivating. This is a stimulant to now go, I, I am saved. I am going to live forever. Lord, what can I do for you? I, I just want to do whatever you want me to do. You, you've just done everything for me, including sitting in my seat. What can I do for you? It's rigged to save us. So do I, do I know that I am saved because I think I'm perfect? Not at all. I know that I am saved because I know that he is perfect. It's about trusting Christ, not self. Somebody once taught me a very important lesson. They said, Julian, when you face doubt, fear, uncertainty or failure... Okay, so here I am, I'm facing doubt, fear, uncertainty, failure. What do I have to do? Turn around. Turn around and face Jesus. Look at his life, his death, resurrection and heavenly ministry. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. He did all that for you and he's not going to change his mind now. He is our saviour. In the little book, Steps to Christ... This is one of the most beautiful passages, again written by that lady, Ellen White. Steps to Christ, page 64. If you haven't read it for a while, I encourage you to read it again. It's a very thin little book. There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ and who really desire to be children of God, yet they realize that their character is imperfect, their life faulty, and they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. To such, I would say... Do not draw back in despair. We, the author included in this, we shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes, but we are not to be discouraged. That is so encouraging. Friends, that's that's the Christian life. We're often going to have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus and say, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry that I did that. Please forgive me. I just want to move forward. And he does forgive. He wants to forgive. He wants to surround you in the courtroom and give you every possible opportunity to accept what he's offering. So can we know that we are saved? I hope hope the scripture has made it clear for us this morning. Yes, because of Christ's gift on Calvary and his ministry on our behalf in heaven today, we can know that we are going to live with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Do we know... For sure, do you know, I I want to give this to you personally now, do you know that you have eternal life? Do you know it? I invite you to come to Jesus again. 
and accept him, accept his eternal life. I want to repeat that beautiful verse that we had read to us at the beginning, John 5, 24. This is the verse that started me to think differently about this whole understanding. Most assuredly, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, I guarantee this. Most assuredly, I say to you that he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. We just saw that. But has passed from death into life. What a beautiful gospel promise right there. Friends, that is the gospel. John 5, 24. Write it down, highlight it. I was going to say tattoo it on your forehead, but no, don't, don't do that. Uh, but that's the gospel right there. Put it somewhere. Put it on the, on the mirror in your bathroom. It's, it's just beautiful. Remember, remember that faith is not an opiate. It's a stimulant. And now that you have maybe a deeper understanding from the beauty of God's word this morning that you are saved or that you, when you choose to be saved, will be saved, if that's not where you're at at the moment, but you can know that you are saved, get up and and be stimulated by that knowledge. I want to finish on that verse again because it's it's just the most beautiful verse. Let's read it all together. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Amen, friends. God bless you. Thank you. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to come before you this morning and say thank you. Lord, your word gives us such a beautiful picture of who you are, that you are love. And as John said, Lord, You are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. Father, I pray that you will fill us with your light, you will fill us with your love, and that you will fill us with your assurance of salvation, with the knowledge that we are going to live with you forever and ever and ever. And Lord, may that have the effect on each heart here this morning that you want it to have. May it turn us to Jesus every moment of every day, May we live and love and shine your light beautifully into the world around us as we await your soon return. Father, thank you for hearing our prayer because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. This message was made available by the Wallara Seventh-day Adventist Church. For more resources like this, visit wallarachurch.org. That's Wallara, W-O-O-L-L-A-H-R-A, church.org. Blessed Assurance Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood, this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy whispering.
whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. submission all is at rest I and my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior. hope you enjoy the short presentation of how God led His people after the Reformation from lineagejourney.com. Funds had been raised by Sabbath school members in California to send a missionary team down to Australia. The intention was to open the work in Australia, but God had additional plans in store. Headed by SN Haskell, the team stopped here in New Zealand for four to five days en route in 1885. Impressed by the friendliness of the people and noting the libraries in town, Haskell commented that the people must be interested in learning and would therefore make good prospects for learning Bible truths. After settling in Melbourne, he decided to return to America and stopped off in New Zealand on the way. He had heard of a group of Sunday-keeping Adventists and found accommodation with Edward and Lizzie Hare. They introduced him to others in the area and he held some meetings over the course of a few weeks. Breaking the evangelistic rule, he presented the Sabbath on the first night and the second coming on the second night. They were convinced and encouraged him to visit the rest of the Hare family who lived north in Cairo. Deciding not to return to the U.S., he stayed with the Hare family in Cayo, about 250 kilometers north of Auckland. This area is rich in religious history, with the Methodist, Anglican, Catholic, and Seventh-day Adventist churches having roots in the area. Here he met the patriarch of the family, Joseph Hare, an Irish orangeman who, along with his family, lived in a house on the mound behind me. He also met his son, Robert, and both of them were preachers. Haskell was invited to speak and spoke for three consecutive Sundays, along with evening meetings and also holding Bible studies during the day in the home. The Hare family decided to keep the Sabbath, and this chemist behind me would end up being one of the first church buildings that they met in. Robert, the son, had a difficult decision to make. He was engaged to be married. The house had been built, the furniture had been ordered, but his bride-to-be objected to his new beliefs. It was marriage or the Sabbath. She wouldn't convert and he wouldn't compromise. The marriage was off and he left for America to study for the ministry at Healdsburg College. Haskell returned in 1886 and ran a two-week evangelistic series. And before he left, he organized the KO Seventh-day Adventist Church, the first in New Zealand on the 23rd of March, 1886. Haskell sent a good report to the General Conference and requested an evangelist be sent. 
The choice was 28-year-old A.G. Daniels, who would later go on to be the longest-serving General Conference president. A.G. Daniels brought with him a 15-square-meter marquee that was pitched here in this park, along with a pedal organ, and together with his wife, lived in a tent on site. A.G. Daniels would lead the first evangelistic tent series in Auckland and drew large crowds. And at the end of 17 weeks of meetings, a Sabbath school with 78 members was started. Later on, a small wooden church was built on McKelvey Street with 67 charter members. And the first service took place on the 15th of October, 1887. This was the first church built in the Southern Hemisphere and still stands today as part of the Ponsonby Seventh-day Adventist Church. Robert Hare would soon return from the USA with his American bride, Henrietta Johnson, and thrust himself into the work here. A few years later, a conference would be formed, and the work would progress to the South Island, with S.N. Haskell, amongst others, starting the church there as well. A few years later, the conference would split into two in 1915. A college was also started at Longburn on the south part of the North Island. When Ellen White was in the South Pacific, she spent some time here helping to establish the church and spoke at the first New Zealand camp meeting and also began writing on the life of Christ while she was down here. And so the stop on the journey to Australia turned into a lot more than just a few days rest. God had bigger plans than just rest and relaxation. S.N. Haskell's return journey to America never materialized then, and instead the church was birthed here in this beautiful country. Sometimes we have big plans that we want God to accomplish, and whilst that's good to have, we must always be open to God turning things around and remember, as Isaiah says, that his ways are higher than our ways. To view more episodes in the series, visit lineagejourney.com. You leave your home and you lock your door. You might even activate the alarm. You might have built a fence to help secure your property. You wear a seatbelt. You take vitamins for your health. You look both ways before crossing the street. All of those things are appropriate for sure. So look at Psalm 20, verse 7. It says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. I'm sure God isn't against horses and chariots, but notice the emphasis. The psalmist suggests we shouldn't trust in them. You can defend yourself, protect yourself, protect your stuff, but your trust must be in God. Of course, we should act prudently, but our protection comes from God. Our health, our well-being, it's all a gift from the Almighty. Do what you need to do. But be sure that your ultimate trust is in the God of heaven. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word. It's been a pleasure bringing you this program here on 3ABN Australia Radio.